You got a problem. Stay away from me. Where's my daughter? What's happening? She's having a psychotic break. <laughs> Put two milligrams out of there. No more experiments. Never a dull day in the hospital. This case reminds me of a 28 year old female I was called to when I was on medical nights. As I got closer, I heard noises of a struggle and started to tread cautiously. Very excited to be reacting to House MD season two, episode 11, Need to Know. On this channel, we are reacting to all 177 house videos. This will be episode 58. Let's see if I can get the diagnosis before house does as a doctor working in London. You okay? Ah, oh, that's not a great way to start on Monday. I hope she has car insurance. Well, and health insurance, I suppose. Seems like from what we saw, she's having involuntary movements of all her body, affected the right arm, left shoulder, and right leg. There are actually a ton of involuntary movements or dyskinesias, and we classify them as tremor, where there's high frequency repetitive movement that doesn't really match what she has, tick, where there's a sudden repetitive twitch or movement of a specific part of the body that can happen repeatedly, usually on the face, can be like repetitive blinking or shrugging of the shoulders. If motor and vocal tics like grunting are combined, then it could be a sign of Tourette's syndrome. Then another type of dyskinesia is a very exaggerated movement called hemibilismus, where a person makes sudden, violent, involuntary flinging movements of arms and legs of one side of the body. No, not like my dancing. You've also got others like tardive dyskinesia, where there are ongoing involuntary asymmetrical movements of the face, myoclonus, which is a sudden jerk, or athetosis, which is a constant distal writhing movement. So which of these fit our patient best? What we saw in the car was quite sudden and violent and affected the right hand and foot. So I would say hemibilismus, but I wonder if there was a little Hollywood flair in there that's throwing me off. Let's get more clues. He's actually on time. Something's happened. Sorry, chief. Never kiss and tell. This is a big deal. This is an affair. Didn't have a lot of time for talking. If you know what I mean. Breaking up a marriage. Fertile ground for high comedy. Wilson, you're like House's conscience following him around like the personification of a moral compass. Maybe House would take more of your advice if you didn't cheat on your wife. What made them suspicious of House though was that he was on time. That means he's usually late, which reminds me of a curious study that was published at the turn of the millennium by psychologist and professor Jeff Conti. Most people think that lateness is a sign of disrespect, but according to Conti's research, that couldn't be more incorrect. In fact, people who are chronically late are more likely to be successful and live longer. The reason? They're optimists. They underestimate the time it takes them to do a task. They feel time is going by more slowly than it actually is. The optimism that makes them late is the same that will help them believe they can achieve something when things get tough. They're also multitaskers that are interested in lots of things, which is part of the cause of the lateness. That doesn't mean you should try and be late though, as it is still seen negatively, but interesting to get a deeper understanding into it nonetheless. The patient's been on a fertility regimen for the last 13 months. Movement disorder can present in the first trimester MRI. See if it's in her head or in her uterus. They're gonna wanna paralyze her. Oh, movement disorder in pregnancy. That would definitely be an unusual case. If House is right, then it sounds like the patient has something called chorea gravidarum, which doesn't help us much in all fairness. That's because it simply describes the moving disorder without necessarily explaining what causes it. For some women, it could be autoimmune and the majority start in the first trimester, as House mentioned. If this patient is pregnant though, she must have what we call a cryptic pregnancy. That's when a woman doesn't know she's pregnant until she goes into labor. They still have their period, pregnancy tests are negative, and they have no bump. It happens in around one in two and a half thousand thousand pregnancies and the baby is usually fine. Generally, hormone imbalances can cause it and if this woman has had infertility, then it isn't too much of a stretch that there could be imbalances. So many interesting angles to this case, I wonder which way it'll go. Too early to commit to a diagnostic guess though. The MRI was clear. Whatever this is, isn't in your brain. The MRI, so I'm not pregnant. I'm sorry, and now that we know you're not pregnant, we're gonna start you on tamoxifen to counteract the estrogen. 
Interesting, so Cameron's theory is that all these fertility treatments are what is giving the patient these symptoms, but now she wants to replace the most common fertility treatment, clomiphene, with the second most common fertility treatment, tamoxifen. She told the patient that would reverse the estrogenic effect. In theory, it makes sense because tamoxifen blocks estrogen receptors in the body, but what happens after that? The ovaries feel there isn't enough estrogen, and so they produce more, spiking the levels in the blood. Blood. It actually is so effective that it boosts ovulation in up to three quarters of women. Quite impressive for an anti-estrogen medication. Bit of a slip up from the writers there, but definitely still good. So question for you smart people, the spike of which hormone induces the release of an egg? Answers down below. You got a problem. Stay away from me. Where's my daughter? What's happening? She's having a psychotic break. Just two milligrams out of there. No more experiments. Never a dull day in the hospital. This case reminds me of a 28 year old female I was called to when I was on medical nights. As I got closer, I heard noises of a struggle and started to tread cautiously. When I turned the corner, the patient was being held against a staircase banister and then held onto it, threw herself around, throwing one of the security guards down a couple of stairs. Luckily, he grabbed on and didn't go all the way down. We quickly got to the patient and gave an intramuscular injection of haloperidol into her thigh. It took a few minutes, but eventually she calmed down and we had to section her under the Mental Health Act. It turns out that she was trying to throw herself down the stairs when security arrived and they put themselves in danger to stop it. Exceptionally brave. We use haloperidol in that situation, which is an old generation antipsychotic because it helps with aggressive behavior more than Ativan, which Foreman gave to this patient. I swear we should start a forfeit that needs to be done every time someone gets Ativan in one of these episodes. Like for every time it's used, I lose the ability to say diagnosis beginning with the letter P. <laughs> that would be hard. So what does this psychosis now indicate? Huntington's disease is top of the list, but that's a bit too easy. So what else could it be? Metabolic could be Wilson's disease or hemochromatosis could do it. Inflammatory could be the thing that rhymes with Rufus. Neoplastic could be paraneoplastic syndrome causing hypercalcemia like a squamous cell lung cancer. Infective could be strep throat infections, can lead to movement disorders or psychosis. So it's called Sydenham's chorea, then that would work very well. Trauma, unlikely because they've scanned her head, which is normal. Okay, so my first guess would be hemochromatosis and second guess, Sydenham's chorea. Let's see how this plays out. What makes mommy run? You're thinking drugs? Cocaine. I'll go look for her stash. It's for a patient, she can't roll. Things like these, I wish I had cancer. I've seen House take down a billionaire, save his ex's new partner, and tie his neighbor to a chair, but never did I think he would make cancer look appealing. Yet here I am, as surprised as a caveman at a ping pong show. Marijuana to relieve cancer pain is actually well studied. There have been a few studies that showed it helps nerve pain, nausea, and vomiting caused by cancer and chemotherapy. It definitely also helps stimulate appetite. That being said though, marijuana itself isn't FDA approved for medical use in cancer. There are products manufactured from it that are though, one of which is called Nabilone. In the UK though, it's only used in research. Mama's little helper. Ritalin. I'm sorry, Ted. I'm moving back to Short Hills. You're running away because the kiss meant something. I don't want you to leave. It's been five years since Stacy left house and he does not want a history repeating itself. Also, yes, maybe the mother is taking Ritalin, but that's not the whole story. She was probably taking it because she was excessively tired from maybe her hemochromatosis or Sydenham's career. I would definitely want to check her ferritin levels, blood for streptococcal antibodies, jelly scan of the heart and a throat swab and then take it from there. Now, if spicy diagnoses float your boat, then check out the channel membership. You get priority access to new videos, access to exclusive polls, and to suggest another series and episode for me to react to. The first 30 members have a chance to win a one hour, one-on-one -on -one tutor session with me on a topic of your choice. We currently have 25 members with only five spots left, so press join below to secure your spot before they're gone. I go back to work. Right now. Fertility treatments have been known to cause endometrial cancer. No ultrasound or uterus this time. 
Oh, just when they thought they'd figure this out. They thought it was because of the Ritalin and then discharged the patient home. Patients having a stroke in medical dramas always seem to collapse, which isn't quite accurate. In reality, the most common symptoms are sudden face, arm or leg weakness and slurred speech. Collapse can happen if the stroke is massive like in the basilar artery, but that is also rare and isn't what they're representing. Makes for pretty good television though. So the team think her fertility meds cause a cancer in the lining of the womb called the endometrium by spiking up estrogen levels. This is a very real problem as estrogen stimulates the lining of the womb and can lead to overgrowth. That's why if we're ever replacing a woman's estrogen after menopause, we always want to give progesterone as well to counteract the effect unless the womb has been taken out by a hysterectomy. That could definitely be the case here, but I wouldn't be worrying about finding the cause right now. I'd be trying to bust that clot or suck it out, and make sure she isn't permanently disabled. It's like someone coming in with a gunshot wound and you doing a prostate exam before taking the bullet out. Time is tissue. You either have a life with me, you can't have a life with him, you can't be both. No endometrial thickening, no masses. Do an endometrial biopsy. Biopsy is painful and unnecessary. Your four weeks just expired. Your reign of terror is over. Yes, finally a house can go back to doing what he wants now, but it seems like he has more than medicine on his mind. He started an affair with his ex Stacy, even though she's now married. House wants her to break up with her husband, but she wants to live a double life. She wants the thrill and excitement of House, but probably knows that he's a bit unstable and she gets that stability from her husband. So what should Stacy do? Different people will say different things. Don't tell her husband as it'll only hurt him. Create a new identity and move to Mexico. Or my personal favorite, become president and then call a press conference denying it all. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Definitely like option C. Whatever she chooses though, they still have a patient to diagnose. It is strange to suspect endometrial cancer so strongly in this patient as only 1% of endometrial cancers are in premenopausal women, which our patient is. House is right to be suspicious, even though the ultrasound was normal though, as it can have a false negative rate of up to 7% of all endometrial cancers. That's more likely when women have a type of endometriosis called adenomyosis, where the lining of the womb starts growing and invading into the womb's muscular wall, rather than behaving itself and staying on the inner layer. So it would make sense to do what we call a hysteroscopy and have a look inside the womb and take a sample I wonder what we'll see. I'll go stick a needle up her hoo-hoo and find that cancer. I, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit dizzy. Oh my God. He's dropping. Get him out of here. We've got to find that bleed. Ultrasound showed the bleed was coming from her liver. It's rare, but the blood got into her fallopian tubes. Blood got into her fallopian tubes? From the liver? That's like saying you got onto the train and stopped off at the space station. The only way that this could be practically possible is if the blood from the liver was going directly into the abdominal cavity, which the fallopian tubes share, and then filling them up with such pressure that it makes a constant bleed like that vaginally. There is one problem with that though. The capacity of the peritoneal cavity is about 40 liters. The average adult human only has five liters of circulating blood, which means for it to accumulate at any kind of pressure to take a not so merry trip up the fallopian tube, down the uterus and vagina, and straight on a Chase's new shoe would leave her with less blood than a Teletubby. I could be missing something here though. Let's find out. She was in her liver. There it is. Well, if it's malignant, at least she's only gonna leave one child without a mother. Do a biopsy. We can't. It's vascular. At least she's only gonna leave one child without a mother. What if she isn't? If blood can get from her liver into her fallopian tubes, then what is stopping a fertilized egg getting from her fallopian tube into her liver? We have a third and final diagnostic guess, hepatic ectopic pregnancy. That would be insanely rare, but possible. You see, when a fertilized egg gets too curious and doesn't land where it's supposed to in the lining of the womb, it can start implanting in weird and wonderful places. This can happen in around 2% of all pregnancies. The most common place for it to land is the fallopian tube in 97% of ectopics, but they can also land in the bowel, abdominal cavity, spleen, and that's right, the liver. That also explains why the writers have said it can't be biopsied because that 
could give it away too easily. The treatment of something like this would usually be a medical termination if caught early enough, but she's already bleeding, which means that she would need surgery to take out the pregnancy. Question for you smart people, have any of these ectopic pregnancies ever survived? If so, how? Answers down below. I'm here about Stacy. I think I'm losing her. You're the only one who's been through this. Can you please be a human being for one minute and talk to me? Sorry, gotta go people dying. That situation was about as awkward as when my colleague fell asleep on a Teams meeting with our whole training program with his mic unmuted, loudly snoring. <laughs> Gotta love remote working. House is obviously avoiding speaking to Mark here as he knows exactly why Cuddy is distant with him. Speaking to Mark here would just be painful for House as well as he's a very real reminder of the person he's causing harm to. It's much easier to to suppress and ignore that, then face the truth about who House is and the implications of his actions. Jungian theory calls these suppressed parts of ourselves the shadow. So what is the significance of this shadow? Well, the idea is that it contains these unconscious parts of ourselves that we would rather keep hidden. It doesn't just contain negative aspects though, and also has many good qualities. And by moving the shadow from the unconscious to the conscious mind can liberate trapped energy and recover one's deeper aliveness. But there is another reason to integrate the shadow. It controls the dark parts of ourselves that are on occasion necessary for survival. By becoming conscious of it, you can control it and stop it from popping up in areas where it shouldn't be. Essentially learning to channel your inner monster. A great metaphor for that is like the Hulk and Bruce Banner. It takes time for Bruce to learn to control the Hulk, to call on those powers only when needed. We can do the same with our shadow selves. You can't manage now. Why does she want another kid? Stroke, blood clot, liver tumor. Birth control pills? I need the surgery. I'm not on the pill. She gave up half her liver to save her marriage. What? Okay, a lot to go through here. The patient has been hiding the fact that she's on birth control pills because she doesn't want another child. She had told her daughter that couples who love each other don't argue. No wonder she can't face her husband and tell him the truth. Now to hide it, she had the tumor cut out even though it was benign because if she didn't, then she would find out about the pills. What an insane story and diagnosis. Although I did fancy the ectopic liver pregnancy theory. Question for you smart people, how often is it normal for a married couple to argue and why? Answers down below. Could a benign tumor have caused all the symptoms? We believe all your wife's symptoms will go away now. Oh, I yeah. can't make you happy. You know I'm right. I've been there before. I might go there again. I'm so afraid if you change, you'll lose what makes you special. Oh, so the patient can carry on lying to her husband, House is subconsciously keeping himself miserable, and Cameron is confirmed HIV negative. With this much joy, who needs Christmas? Good episode overall, I'd say 7 out of 10 entertainment, 5 out of 10 diagnosis, 5 out of 10 accuracy. This episode makes way more sense though when you watch the previous episode where the team become code breakers. Click here.